I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Mark Weimer, a double board certified facial plastic surgeon to beautify.com's podcast series. Dr. Clymer is the medical director of Clymer Facial Plastic Surgery, which is located in Brentwood, Tennessee. He specializes exclusively in facial procedure and has more than 32 years of experience in facial reconstructive and cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic facial surgery is very popular with hundreds of thousands of women and men each year selecting a facial procedure, of which a facelift is one of the top three. Today, we will be talking about facelift facts and what you should know if you are considering getting a facelift. Welcome, Dr. Clymer. Thank you, Yvette. Good to be with you again. Um, look forward to dispelling some myths and giving some information about facelifts today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I was thinking about this subject and I thought of um, the adage you hear or the concept of aging gracefully. As a facial plastic surgeon, what does this saying mean to you? I think that there, there can be a number of different connotations depending on the patient or the person using that little phrase. Uh, I think sometimes it is used as an anti-plastic surgery statement. It's like, oh, you should just age gracefully. And my reply is generally, well, I mean, I think having well done facial plastic surgery, that is well done uh, what I call facial rejuvenative surgery. And we talked about rhinoplasty on our last podcast. Today, the facelift topic is more of a rejuvenation procedure, not a structural one like rhinoplasty. But when you're talking about rejuvenative surgery, the key is that patients look refreshed, rested, and better, but still look like themselves. I, I don't ever want my patient to look pulled plastic or altered. My little uh, phrase to my patients is that you want, I, I want you to look different, better, but not different other. So, mm -hmm. and, and what I would love to hear is people say, you know, gosh, I, I, I just look like me, but the sagging neck is gone. And what they get and report back to me in terms of what um, I think is a well-done uh, procedure is that they'll say, well, I saw these friends and all they said to me is, that you look great. Have, have you lost weight? Or, I, I love what you've done to your hair or is that new eye makeup? None of which have been changed, okay? Um, but the change has been the surgical change, but they get what I tell the patients are the head scratching compliments. So a patient looking, they're kind of like, wow, you, you look, what, what is it? Well, it's the surgery they've had, but it cannot be identified as surgery. That is well done facial rejuvenation surgery. And I think the fear of the opposite of that, the pull plastic look, is when people say, well, you don't want to look like that. So just acefully, right? Just, you know, just kind of let time take its toll and don't do anything. So, you know, my reply is usually, well, I think having well done facial plastic surgery age gracefully, do we? We brush our teeth, we floss, we put a very strong chemical fluoride on them, we drill them and take out mm -hmm. cavities and things. We do all of these things to our teeth. And the interesting thing is teeth, hair, skin, and nails, you know, the skin primarily we're talking about. And and the muscles and fat pads underneath it, they have the same embryological origins as teeth. We don't think twice about maintaining our teeth. We don't let our teeth age gracefully and rot mm -hmm. and fall out of our mouths. We right. maintain them and we turn yeah. back the test of clot. We can sometimes even and whiten them, right? But when it comes to your, you know, your facial appearance, your neck, your jawline, somehow people put that in a different bucket and they think, oh, just age gracefully and just kind of let this happen. And, and that I think is really, um, it, it's, it's used sometimes as, as an objection to facial plastic right. surgery. And many times those objections are coming from places, you know, truly of envy for one reason or another that patients are saying, or oh, ju just age gracefully, that person doesn't have the resources or kind of the, the courage to, to launch into that kind of rejuvenative procedure so I, I just, I believe that aging gracefully are using good techniques and good surgeons and well-trained people to help you age gracefully so you look rested, refreshed, and rejuvenated regardless of the number of the age. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. And you are so right. 
with people whitening their teeth and what have you. So you're just looking for a way to help you look like the better version of you. So when do you start seeing facelift candidates? Are there signs on their skins that you identify? So given that uh, very clear explanation you just made, when do you start seeing uh, men and women in your office for to see if they're a facelift candidate? Well, the facelift patient, the age range or the chronological number can really vary. The concern that I see most often on my facelift patients is, quote unquote, I hate my neck and they come or, or my chin. They're, they're grabbing the neck sagging. And then the next thing is that, and I don't like this hanging down under my jawline, which we call the jowls. There are marionette lines, kind of the deep folds on either side of the lips going down. So I would say 98, 99% of my patients, number one concern when, when I recommend a facelift is I hate my neck. So a, a, a true neck lift, though, that lifts the neck does not get the jawline and jowl as well because you have to be above something to lift it, right? Sounds kind of rudimentary. But when I lift the cheek and the jowl area, that tightens along the jawline. So essentially a cheek jowl neck lift is what I call a facelift. And so the concerns are usually from the cheeks on down, sagging, I look tired, angry or mad. And so the the my facelift, what I call a facelift, corrects all those areas. Now, when I say what I call a facelift, what what I mean is that the term facelift is not standardized. So a facelift is not a facelift is not a facelift. What a facelift is is determined by how, what the, how the surgeon defines it so there's all these terms out there there's a facelift there's a mid facelift there's a neck lift there's a mini facelift there's an s lift there's an o lift most of those don't describe anything other than what the surgeon has assigned to kind of their little tweak their modification and what they're trying to make it sound like is their secret sauce so to speak and so you know, what, what I tell patients is that it's more important to talk about what we're doing than what it's called, but we have to call it something. So what I call a quote unquote facelift is cheeks on down, cheek, jowl, neck, and therefore what, and I'm recommending that when I hear from the patient, I don't like my neck. I hate my jowls, you know, this, this sagging underneath here and the age really ranges from, I've even done you know, a patient had a very, very heavy neck. <clears throat> she was 38 years old. It's probably the youngest facelift I've ever done. I've done a patient for facelift who's 81 years old, and she was 81 going on 50, you know, very healthy and vibrant and, and everything in between. So I start hearing those complaints probably most commonly 40 to early 50s, up to 60s, 70s. And the question then the patient poses to me is, as well, you know, I, I, when should I do this? What's the best time or age to do this? And my answer is, well, you do it when it bothers you enough and you're sitting here in consultation with me. So it bothers you enough, right? <laughs> and you have enough to do and you have enough to do because I recommended that there is significant bang for the buck. This is not a long run for a short slide because I have patients where I say, you know what, you need to, you need to wait a year or two or three or five. There's just not enough laxity there yet. It, 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 won't, it won't be worth it. The healing process is, is different. You just got to wait a while. So when it's enough to do, great bang for the buck, the age, the number doesn't matter. And it's really patient dependent. When do they see it as most bothersome? Okay, so that, that clarifies a lot. So it's really customized in all these terms about mini, mid, uh, the thread lifts, and all those are just names that were given. <laughs> to cover facial rejuvenation. And it's again up to you to discuss with your patient what is best for them. So exactly. I understand- Exactly. Okay, okay I got it. <laughs> so I understand that some of the techniques, surgical techniques have changed. Can you discuss a little bit about the surgical process and what a patient can expect, particularly with the healing? Sure. The, I think the big, um, when you look at facelift surgery, 
I look at it as sort of two very uh, broad categories. The first category are uh, terms, and again, I said there's not standardized terms, but there are some terms that are more descriptive of what is done. One is called a short flap SMAS. SMAS is S-M-A-S, capital S, capital M, capital A, capital S. Stands for Superficial Musculoepineurotic System. Big long word, which is why we use the acronym SMAS. Um, but it is basically going under the skin a short distance and then either folding the SMAS over or suturing the SMAS up. But the distance that things are kind of freed up or released are not as far out. The other category, which is what I do, is called deep plane facelifting. And there's a couple of nuances of deep plane. Uh, mine has evolved slightly over my 25, 30 years. But, I, you know, I used to think that deep plane would would scare patients. The terms like, oh, my gosh, how how deep in my face are you going? Right. It's not necessarily a measurable depth as it is an anatomical layer. So when I'm in consultation, I'll have my white coat on. And I say, well, if I go under my underneath my white coat here and I kind of try to pull things, you know, things will sort of pull. But if I go underneath my white coat a little ways and then I dip underneath my scrub top, my jacket, my scrub top, everything comes together. So the deep plane is going under the smass and further out under the cheek, which therefore allows things to be lifted, not pulled back. Other surgeons will disagree with me with this. They will argue with this, but I firmly believe that the deep plane facelift looks more natural and lasts longer. Okay. Um, I just, I, I believe that, which is why I don't deviate from that technique. It's the best technique going. And I've got, you know, decades of, of experience with it and my patients love it. It gives maximum results and maximum benefits, but maximum results and with while still looking very natural. One of my, you know, me and Yvette, I like to use a lot of analogies. One that I use in consultation with patients is if you are making your bed in the morning, right? It's the covers are all rumpled and there's some ridges. If you just grab those, uh, the, the bedspread up the comforter up by the pillows, you pull it up, bed's made. Took you like five seconds, right? It doesn't look so good. I mean, there's still some ripples and it's not redraped. It doesn't look great. But if you get, that's that's the short, what I call the short flap facelift. If you get air underneath that bedspread, you work down the right side, you go to the foot of the bed, you work around the other side, you're redraping it all, bed looks beautifully made. That's deep plane facelifting. Takes longer to do, takes more expertise on the surgeon's part, takes more work and effort. But in my opinion, better result in terms of longevity and more natural look. So th those are the kind of two big buckets as I see it. You know, everyone, um, pretty much anyone who's doing facelift surgery does something to that smash. It's, are you just tightening it? Are you pulling it a certain direction? Are you putting just stitches in it? Or in deep plane, are you going under it, getting the, the muscles, the fat pads to move better and everything comes up together and looks more natural? And I just think that's the the best technique going. Well, that's that that clears it up quite a bit for me. I particularly liked your analogy. Um, so what is the recovery? And I know people always ask about scars. Can you enlighten our listeners today? Sure, sure. Yeah, the recovery again it varies some patient to patient, obviously, but I tell patients in general it is a two week hideout time. Two weeks being, you know, uh, bruising and swelling. What keeps most people in primarily is more the bruising than the swelling. I do a lot of things to minimize bruising. I give all my patients Arnica Montana, which is an herb that reduces bruising. Um, <clears throat> I have used a technique for over 20 years called platelet gel. It's now also known as PRP, platelet-rich plasma. So people have heard, oh yeah, I know PRP, but if I say platelet jelly, what are you talking about? I've just used it. I used it way before it became this buzzword, right? So if I say platelet gel, PRP, they're, they're the same thing. But that technique is where I take the patient's own blood during surgery. We have a centrifuge in the room. We separate the platelets and plasma out from the red blood cells. I missed that under the skin 
and it seals off little capillaries that leak later and cause bruising and patients bruise less. Their bruising goes away faster. Now we're mm -hmm. finding it helps build collagen, so good long-term bounce. And I don't leave any drainage tubes of my face lift surgery. So that there's no, no drains that the patient has to deal with because of that PRP you know, platelet gel. So I think that really enhances their recovery, speeds them through it. They're still going to have some degree of bruising. Um, and bruising should be minimal at two weeks. And I'll tell patients, you, you'll still have some bruising, but bruising should be coverable with makeup at the two-week point. Maybe not the patient's makeup, but we have a little cover-up palette that my esthetician helps the patient with, you know, says, well, that, that little shade of green needs this color, and then put your makeup on. So we, we match the shade and the makeup palette to the residual bruise so that at two weeks, people are out and about. Um, I put a pressure dressing on my patients the first night. I tell all my patients, you're going to hate me the first night because very tight, choky tight under the neck. So they go sort of from hate me for 24 hours to dislike me for three to five days to be okay with me for another week to then mm -hmm. love me for decades because of the result they got. So, and not all facelift surgeries have that recovery. It, it's kind of like mortgage interest. It is front loaded. They got to put up with more on the front end but I would not do this technique where they have to put up with that if they did not get the bounce on the back end. And that is decades of benefit, much more natural look. Okay. So if you're a woman, I understand that a woman can hide her little scar behind her hair, but what about a man and what can, maybe it's an antiquated notion I have about facelifts that you have a scar? Yeah. Uh uh, no, not antiquated. That's good. And I kind of bounced over the scar question here. So I'll well, circle back to that with both difference with men and women and what you should have to do with scars. So the scar, the, the word scar to the layperson means visible looks bad, right? To a surgeon, if I make an incision in the skin and I put stitches, the body heals that with forming scar tissue, which holds it together. So not all scars are visible. The reason that a traumatic, so somebody goes through the windshield or they're cut, that is an unplanned scar, tends not to heal as well or look as good. I plan scars for my face the patients. So that scar, or I call it incision line, the incision line I make is hidden in natural skin creases so that after the patient heals, you don't see, what you see is a little skin crease, which was there before, I just use that as the camouflage area to place the scar. So, you know, technically I have to tell patients, I said, well, why, well, I have a scar. I said, well, I mean, honestly, biologically, yes, you have a scar, but visibly you don't have a scar. You don't have a visible scar. Okay. Sometimes the incisions that I will widen a little bit, or I don't let my patients have any visible scar, you know, one year point, we, we will keep working on it till it's invisible. Um, with, you know, and so then the location and the pattern of where you place those scars or those incisions is very important because if you don't put them in a natural crease, well, they're going to show more. So somebody's sitting behind somebody at church or in a movie theater and they see this scar from behind the earlobe back down the, the, back down the hairline, not where I put mine. That's a placement thing. That's not a healing thing. So placement matters. And in the, even the placement of the incisions, so every, we all have a little tuft of hair in front of our ear, right? Men can grow it down as a sideburn. Women have a little tuft that sometimes they pull up over their ear. That tuft of hair, if the scar is quote unquote hidden above it, that tuft of hair can get lifted up. So now their hairline starts at the top of their ear, not in front of their ear, mm. and they look windswept. So mm. there can be a windswept plastic look merely by the poor placement of the incision wow. before you even get underneath to deal with this mass or short flap or deep plane or anything like that. So incision placement is critical. How they're put together is critical and hiding them is critical. But at the end of the, you should go into a facelift thinking when this is healed and, and the, the full healing for a facelift is about a year, maybe a year and a half. That's where incisions are fading. They're blending into that skin crease they're pink for quite a while. They need cover up makeup for six or eight weeks, easy. But the proof is in the pudding with this. So when I describe where I place my facelift incisions for patients, I say, okay, call me on this. 
go home, go back to my website. So people listen to this podcast, go to my website, look at all the side views and ask yourself, do I see a scar? Mm -hmm. Is there a visible evidence of where he has been with the incision? And furthermore, does the earlobe look natural? Does the ear canal look natural? And is the tuft of hair in front of the ear still natural, not hiked up, hiked up way up the temple? Because those are kind of telltale signs. And that's a whole nother topic for a different podcast, how you don't have to be trained in facial plastic surgery to recognize. I mean, the question I would pose to you, Yvette, is that it, you, you kind of know when you see a bad facelift, right? Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> but, but well, how do you know? Well, you know, because there are certain visual cues, excuse me, that, that the human brain is hardwired to recognize. And when incisions or techniques disrupt those cues, the layperson goes, oh, that, boy, their hair starts, they look a little windswept. Oh, their ear, oh, they've had a bad face. Right. If you leave those alone, you hide incisions and natural creases, people look natural, and then they get the head scratching compliments, right? right. You look great. You just, you're on vacation or have you lost weight? You're, you know, that's what patients most commonly get with the great neck. So scars can be avoided the one of the biggest detriments to poor healing and scar formation is smoking so i make my patients stop smoking two weeks before two weeks after surgery so not all of this is within my control not all of it is within the patient's control but you control the controllables you know i would say 99 98 99% of my patients never need any little scar touch up the ones that do, I do that in the office and we rehide them. And I'm not, I tell them I'm not gonna let you have a visible scar. So biologically, yeah, you have to have, you have to tell a patient, I mean, this is how the healing process, if I say, well, right, no, you won't right. have a scar. Yeah. That's not, that's not scientifically honest. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll have one, but it's going to look like a natural crease. You're not going to see it. You'll have an invisible scar or a hidden incision. That makes a lot of sense. And that's very reassuring. Um, so you did allude to the fact of decades, so a patient can expect a facelift results to last 10 plus years? Or Yes, that, that's a great question. I discuss that all the time because you pose a question, well, how long does a facelift last? Uh, I believe that depends on the technique. However, there was a study that was done that looked at, you know, not strictly the technique that I used, but it's a study that the answer, kind of the book answer, how long does the face lift last? Book answer is usually the surgeon will say eight to 10 years. Um, that comes from a study that looked at when were a significant number of people coming back for what's called a tuck up, a little refresher, kind of a mini lift to refresh in the result, not the whole ball of wax over and a ball of wax over again, a refresher mini tuck up type lift. And they found that there was a, a lot of people coming back between eight and 10 years. So the book answer is eight to 10 years. Okay. My personal record is that I have done six tuck-ups where patients were between eight and 10 years. And I do 150 plus facelifts a year. So I only have six people that obeyed the books. Okay. I have, I, just this week, I did my seventh person between 10 and 20 years. She was 17 years out, still loved her brown eyes, which I did 17 years ago. I'm sorry, she was 18 years out, 18 years out, just did her Tuesday, 18 years out, just wanted a little refreshener, had a little loose skin, but still looked better than before surgery, okay, 18 years out. So I've got about seven now people between 10 and 20 years, I have people 20 plus years I haven't seen back, okay, wow. and, you know, pe people, they return for other things, so I see them a long time down the road. One of the tuck ups that I did in that ten to twenty year, this lady, she was, she was, she was seventeen years out. Had this done when she was sixty, came back in age seventy seven. I love my brow, I love my eyes. I still love my neck. I got a little bit of this jowl back. What can we do, Doctor Climber? And I said, we just it's called a tuck up. It's a little mini lift. So we did that. She has a great jawline back. Seventy seven, looking fantastic, running her business. Go get her right. So I tell patients that. You should get decades of benefit. You never have to do this again. I firmly believe that longevity is tied to the deep plane facelift. And I, you know, you know, my track record is 
that yes, I have a few people obeying the books. The majority are not obeying the books. But one of the main take home points is that you always maintain the benefit of having a well done facelift. It's not a souffle. You never get back to pre surgery. So even in my tuck ups, those patients like, I still look better than I did before, but I got a little looseness that I want to refresh. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you never, you, you never get back to square one where you were before your facelift. Well, you certainly have given us a lot of great facts, and I'd like to invite our listeners to stay tuned, because if you're not interested in a facelift just yet, we will be talking with Dr. Clymer about non-facial rejuvenations. So thank you, Dr. Clymer. Very excellent. And if you want to see those before and after pictures of his patients, visit his website at ClymerMD.com. Thank you, Dr. Clymer. Thank you, Yvette. A pleasure again. Look forward to talking to you about the uh, non-surgical rejuvenation techniques.